So now it is time to get into the second Doctor, Patrick Troughton. Similar to the first Doctor, I will be ranking stories, companions, and then giving my thoughts on the overall era. I will be using the same ranking format as before. Let's not waste any time and jump right into it. Number 21, and the only mediocre story we have, and that is The Space Pirates. Yeah, this one was pretty obvious, as it is the most universally disliked Second Doctor story. For most of the Second Doctor's tenure, the pacing of older stories definitely picked up and were a bit easier to get through. However, this story feels like an early First Doctor story with how goddamn slow it was. The story just felt bland and ran for way too long, and the character of Milo Clancy got way too fucking annoying way too quickly. Plus, it's honestly pretty forgettable. Like, I legitimately have a hard time remembering what happened in this story. It also doesn't help that this was the final lost story of Doctor Who with only one episode remaining intact. Just everything about this story felt off for me, and for a lot of people. Enough beating around the bush. Bland, forgettable, terrible pacing, and horrific acting make this the worst second Doctor story there is. With a couple highlights from the TARDIS crew that prevent it from being totally bad. Now getting into decent stories for number 20, which is The Crotons. Ironically, another Robert Holmes story. Luckily, the man redeemed himself later on. This has a lot of good ideas and intriguing bits here and there. However, certain aspects prevent it from being truly great. I really like the idea of self-perpetuating slavery, as the Doctor puts it. These people being forced to live in fear and be enslaved by who they assume is godlike beings when they don't even realize that they're the ones being enslaved. Parts of the story were also quite interesting in regard to the people wanting to strike back against the Crotons, the Doctor and Zoe being interrogated, and the slow build to how everything turns out. However, it is a bit of a slog to get through and not as interesting as it could have been. Despite this, it's a decent story with a decent premise and some good themes, but not much else. Number 19, and it is Fury from the Deep. I really wanted to like this story. I really did. It has a great setup, an interesting villain, an intriguing location, and an overall atmospheric vibe. However, I felt in the way it told its story was uninspired and a bit boring. Like, it was more focused on the reaction to the situation than the situation itself. It featured so much talking and so much of figuring the creature out that you don't let the creature do its thing and be terrifying. So it just comes off as boring. I feel like the third Doctor story, Inferno, is pretty much the exact same premise, but done way better. But we'll get there when we get there. I feel like the TARDIS crew has little to do. I barely remember Jamie doing anything of note in the story. The Doctor is just going around trying to figure things out and telling people not to do this thing, and they do the thing anyway. And then Victoria just having fucking PTSD from traveling in the TARDIS, but not having it be executed properly. She's just like, oh, I'm sad for the entire story, and then decides to leave. At least it's more creative than just staying for a guy she fell in love with 20 minutes ago. It has some great setup, but this one unfortunately falls flat for me. Now we get into good with number 18, which is The Highlanders. Another very good story that somewhat suffers from pacing. This would pretty much be the last pure historical, with the exception of Black Orchid, and while there are better ones, it was a good note to end on. It once again reminds me of the Romans, and to a greater extent, the Mythmakers, where everyone goes on their own tangent for the majority of the serial. Polly's storyline is good and quite interesting. She is with a Scottish woman and is trying to get back to the Doctor and Ben, who are going to be hanged as they were found with rebels. I think the Doctor and Ben's storyline is a bit more interesting, mainly because the Doctor starts to impersonate a German Doctor, and it's pretty damn funny. The overall story with the villain Grey was pretty interesting, with trying to ship Scottish rebels to the colonies. As I said, it suffers from pacing, but it's not that bad overall. It has good storylines, an overall good story, and some pretty good and fun highlights. Nothing amazing, but a good serial that more importantly introduces Jamie McCrimmon. Number 17 with The Underwater Menace. I will admit, this is a bit of a cheesy story, mainly due to the very terrible costumes and lackluster set design. However, it does make up for it in overall story, despite it being simplistic. A professor that the Doctor knew wants to raise Atlantis from the sea back to the land, and he needs the Doctor's help. Similar to the previous story, everyone goes off and has their own 
little tangent. The doctor is with the professor, Polly is supposed to be turned into a fish person, and Ben and Jamie work in the mines. You have this steady buildup of the doctor realizing that raising Atlantis would be disastrous for Earth and trying to tell everyone it's a bad idea. Then everyone gets enraptured into a revolution and everything eventually leads into a bombastic climax. While it is known for the very poor costume and set design, I think the slow buildup and everyone's storylines are quite good. Even the pacing is good. I think it does suffer from some slow points and the production design is quite bad, but I don't think this is a story that is overall terrible. You just have to get over some bad designs for certain things is all. Number 16 is The Abominable Snowmen. I think this is one of those cases where I really wanted to like the story, but it suffered from piss poor pacing. The villain is good, the story is good, the production value is very good. However, it was an absolute slog to get through. It's a steady mystery, but it does suffer from the same thing that Fury from the Deep suffers from. Too much talking about nothing, as well as it being way too long. It should have been a four episode serial. However, the things they do get right is quite good. The slow build up to what is actually happening to the Yeti and who is really behind it all is quite good and interesting. The Great Intelligence is a very good and very creepy villain, and it's a shame he wasn't used very much outside of this end of the sequel story, which we'll get to soon. It does have some good atmosphere as well, and the scenes with the Great Intelligence are great. However, as I said, it suffers from too much talking about the situation rather than showcasing the situation on screen and the horrific pacing but it still manages to get a few good things really, really right. Number 15 is The Web of Fear. A bit better than its predecessor, but that's not saying much. It does still suffer from poor pacing, but it still is a bit better and is more about showcasing the actual situation than talking about it. The setting is definitely a lot better and eerier. The Yetis are a lot better and creepier looking, and the overall threat of them is better showcased. We get the first appearance of Alistair Lethbridge Stewart here, and while not showcased as he would be in the invasion, it was still very great to see him in his first major story. I do think it is a bit too long and suffers from bad pacing as I said. It is not nearly as a slog as the Abominable Snowman. The mystery is also very good here, and I feel like there was a bit more meat to this story. Despite it feeling a bit too long in some areas, there's more of a story here than in The Abominable Snowman. That might be due to the backstory, the fact that this is a sequel to a previous story, and more noteworthy characters, hence making it more memorable. I will admit that the one thing the previous story did better was the creepiness of the Great Intelligence, but that doesn't make it bad here. I think it more so makes up for the creepiness in its setting. Overall, it has a better story, better setting, creepier atmosphere, better characters, better character designs, and great design over the abominable snowman. However, it still suffers from being a bit too long and a bit of a slog. Number 14 is the Ice Warriors. Despite introducing a very good and decently popular villain, this one suffers from a weak story and once again poor pacing. I swear, I'm not some guy that needs explosions every 5 seconds. Sometimes these serials are very hard to get through, as well as having too many episodes when it's not needed. Despite this, what it does get right are the Ice Warriors themselves. They are a good villain, and despite a rather formulaic plan of taking over the world, it's still an engaging story despite its flaws. I do like the design, even though the Ice Warriors are very rotund for some inexplicable reason, but hey, it makes them more unique, so whatever, go for it. While I do think they were better in future stories, the Ice Warriors were still rather good here, and are a formidable threat despite a very formulaic plan. But the story was still rather good despite its slow pacing, as well as the side characters not being very memorable. Number 13 is The Dominators. I feel this is a story that doesn't really get a lot of attention, despite being a genuinely good story. It does start off a bit slow, but luckily it does get going pretty quickly. It is once again a very simple plot of the Dominators needing fuel, so they decide to pretty much take a whole planet down with them just to get the rocket fuel. It showcases the Doctor at one of his most formidable and manipulative, and the Dominators are actually pretty good villains. The Quarks, although, seem cuter than they are scary, even though they were supposed to be the next Dalek, pretty much. The side characters are all pretty likable, and as I said, it's not that slow-paced like the last few entries, so that's why I gave it an extra half point. I do think it was the best decision to make it five episodes rather than six, because it feels more clean-cut with little filler. Overall, I thought this was a genuinely good story. It has some good villains, a good simplistic plot, better pacing, some good side characters, and a slightly more sinister doctor. It does suffer from a bit of a slow start and some uninspired production designs, though. 
Next up are the very good stories with number 12, The Wheel in Space. I feel as though, despite it being very good, it could have been a lot better. Apparently, this is one of the more hated stories from the Second Doctor era, and I can kind of see why. The Cybermen didn't really need to be the villain here, but despite this, I thought their inclusion was great. Mainly because it's my favorite Cybermen design, and I do think they have an intriguing plan, and are still formidable. I thought the story was very fun, and the pacing wasn't terrible. I didn't find it dull or clunky while watching, and I enjoyed myself while watching their plan unfold and how they'll get out of this. There are plenty of Under Siege stories that are a lot better than this, and we'll get to those soon, and it does remain a bit forgettable, but while watching, I remember really liking the actual story, the Cybermen being a good threat, and showcasing a very great companion. It's not perfect or one of the better Second Doctor stories, but I guess I just have a soft spot for it. Next is number 11, and I know people will hate me for this, but... The Evil of the Daleks. It's considered one of the best Dalek stories of all time, the second Doctor's best, and an overall very excellent story. I thought it was pretty good. I think what kind of deterred me was because all of the screenshots I saw for this story was from the very last episode with the Supreme Dalek and being on Scaro. So I thought the entirety of the story would take place on the planet instead of just the last episode. With that, I was very disappointed by the plot of this story with it taking place in the Victorian era rather than on Scaro. I thought the plot was fine and interesting with the Daleks trying to find the factor that makes them humans beat them constantly. You'd think that they're trying to become even better to vanquish and conquer the rest of the universe, but no, they're pretty much like, destroy that shit. As I said, it's not a bad story, but I think the overhyping from fans kinda killed it for me. I expected something really, really amazing with the hype behind it, and I just thought it was a very good story. I liked the side characters, especially Edward Waterfield, he was very likable. Victoria didn't really do anything of note though, which can be explained as her entire tenure on the show. Overall, while I do think it is a very good story with good side characters, the Doctor and Jamie being great as always, and the Daleks being formidable, the overall hype surrounding it didn't live up to my expectations as well as having an overall slow pace and a ridiculous plot from the Daleks. Number 10 is The Mind Robber. Now with this one, while I necessarily don't love the entire story, I do respect it in a way. The first episode is genuinely fantastic. There is such a great, creepy atmosphere that pulls you in, similar to many other stories, most notably An Unearthly Child. While here, the story does live up to the introduction a bit more than An Unearthly Child does, it still isn't exactly the best story. I respect it because it's so different from the rest of the Second Doctor's era that I appreciate it. Each era is defined by a certain tone of story. I mentioned the first Doctor's was very experimental as they were trying to figure out what to do and what their niche was. But the second Doctor, it was heavy on science fiction and alien planets. With the Mind Robber, it's anything but. The overall tone is very cerebral and more driven into the realm of fantasy than science fiction. As much as I like the Second Doctor's era and how much of an overall improvement it is to the First Doctor's era in many ways, it does get a bit monotonous sometimes. So when the Mind Robber comes in, it does sort of break up the monotony, which is why I respect and appreciate it so much. In terms of the actual story, it is pretty good. The Doctor and company trying to navigate this strange fantasy land in the hopes of getting out of this strange universe wherever they actually are, as well as seeing fictional characters crop up tons of puzzles and overall a fun sense of adventure. It is missing something though that I can't exactly put my finger on. I try to figure it out, but something about it doesn't make it totally perfect. The pacing is good, the performances are good, the writing is good, the tone is fantastic, the atmosphere is spectacular, and the TARDIS crew does a good job and each has a good storyline throughout the serial. But something about it is missing, and I can't really figure out what it is. But it's something that prevents it from being better than it could have been. Now we get into great stories with number 9, The Faceless Ones. I thought this was a very well executed story with a couple snags here and there. I love the premise, and for the most part, the execution is very good. It's a classic Invasion of the Body Snatchers-esque story, but with a bit more science behind it. The overall mystery is very slow and methodical, but luckily, it's never boring. The overall mystery is very slow and methodical, but luckily, it's never boring. In fact, I found the first half to be better than the second half of the story. Once everything is revealed, it does lose a bit of steam and becomes a bit slower and not as interesting as the mystery part of the serial. 
However, it's definitely not bad, clearly. I still was intrigued with where everything was going to go, and the actual plan of the chameleons was quite interesting. I like the alien makeup quite a lot, actually. It's just sort of this dirty-looking thing. I can't really describe it, but it was a really good design. Not as clean-cut as other races that have appeared on the show. The only major negatives I have is the slow pace in the latter half of the story, and the fact it could have had a bit more of a horror spin onto it. Now, I don't know what they could get away with back then, but I feel if it had a bit more of a creepy atmosphere in some areas and more of a focus on suspense, the story would have been much better. As well as the fact that Ben and Polly receive a very unceremonious exit. Outside of that though, this was a very great serial. The story is a classic one and very well executed. The mystery is phenomenal. The alien design is terrific and I thought the actual plan of the chameleons was a good and interesting one. However, it does suffer from a bit of slow pacing in the second half, lack of good horror and suspense, and a rather dull exit to some great companions. Number 8 is The Power of the Daleks. This is just one of those stories that works perfectly to when it was showcased. What do I mean by that? Well, Power of the Daleks works in a way where it couldn't have featured any other Doctor, nor could it have featured the second Doctor later on in his era, and that's what I admire most about it. The fact that the entire crux of the story depends on the fact that we don't know what happened to the Doctor, as there was not such a thing as regeneration at this point. William Hartnell was the Doctor. That was it. There was no one else. There was not even a thought to make him someone else. So when you had this new guy coming in, not really explaining himself well, which is totally in character for Troughton's Doctor, everyone is kind of just like, what the fuck? So you had this guy running around saying he was the Doctor, and on top of that, his most formidable villain are acting like servants. No one back then had any idea what to think of anything. Just... Everything in terms of the background and ideas relating to this story just worked so incredibly well that it was just the perfect introduction story for the idea of a new doctor when there wasn't an idea of a new doctor up until this point. The story itself doesn't live up to that caliber, however, it is still genuinely great. As I said, the Daleks acting like servants to another race was totally out there and a genuinely good way of reintroducing the villains alongside a new doctor. Their ultimate goal is of course then later revealed that they want to do what they do best, trying to take over with a new Dalek army. The ongoing mystery is a great one, and there is a bit more of a horror aspect to it that it makes it a little better, and something the Faceless Ones could have used. When the Doctor, Ben, and Polly ultimately find the three surviving Daleks in the capsule, it is an intensely creepy scene. Plus, the head scientist ultimately going insane because of what he's done and what the Daleks truly are is sad. But it's also very terrifying and a genuinely accurate reaction to what someone would do if they figured out letting the ultimate evil of the universe out onto the world once more. While I do think that the ideas and the themes surrounding the serial of the new Doctor and the Daleks being servants was ultimately better than the story itself, I do think the plot is quite good, the Daleks are once again a good and formidable threat, and the horror is well executed. However, it does suffer from moments of slowness and the story not living up to the caliber of the themes that the writers were going for. Number 7 is The Tomb of the Cybermen, a fantastically executed story with very little wrong with it. This is certainly one of those stories where every single solitary thing praising it has been said already. Everything in regard to the well-paced story, the excellent use of the Cybermen, the amazing sets, the mystery in regards to two humans, eventual thirst for power, and the touching conversation the Doctor has with Victoria about family. I think mostly everything about this story is fantastic. The Cybermen don't look as good as they did in previous serials, but it's still a very good design. I do think that the human villains of the story are a bit generic and formulaic, but the problem is without them we wouldn't have had this story. But the eventual twist that they're evil and what eventually happens to them is fairly obvious and kind of throws a wrench into an otherwise great and almost flawless story. Everything else about the serial is near perfect. The performances from the TARDIS crew, the use of the Cybermen and expanding their lore further, the set design, the suspense and atmosphere, the emotional scenes, and the very excellent cliffhanger of the second episode. However, the Catch-22 regarding the plot point of the human villains isn't great but is necessary to push the story further. Number six is The Seeds of Death, the much, 
much better Ice Warrior story in the Second Doctor era. While the original story was decent, but for the most part kind of forgettable, slowly paced, and bland, this one is by far superior. The plot in regards to the Ice Warriors is actually a rather creative one, to take out the enemy before they really invade. However, there are still some snags here and there. While you really can't blame the effects back then, it is a bit ridiculous when the aesthetic for the rest of the episode is quite good, and then the actual gadgets that the damn title is named for are just balloons and bubbles. Especially when bubbles were already used as a villain before this in Fury from the Deep. But despite this, I thought this was an extremely well-made and well-paced story. I feel it, for the most part, utilizes all six episodes to tell a great story. It builds up the villain quite well, and they still have that certain level of creepiness that made them formidable in their previous story. The solution to all of this is very idiotic with it being water, the thing that stops the seed pods. Like really, you couldn't have used something better. But despite this and some other small flaws, I thought this was a great story. With a villain that was better executed here, the TARDIS crew being on top form, some good production design ignoring the actual seeds of death, and the story being well paced and well executed. It does suffer from some idiotic props and the actual solution not making a whole lot of sense, but despite this, the good far outweighs the bad. Number 5 is The Moon Base. Going back to the Cybermen, this is easily one of the best stories I've seen of them so far. It's a classic under siege story and it is an absolutely magnificent mystery that builds and builds and builds exceptionally. While I did say that I do love the original Cybermen design as it perfectly captures what the writer slash production team were going for, I do still majorly like the subsequent redesigns. This one is definitely a good one despite the hands being a bit weird. While I haven't mentioned the idea of missing episodes a lot mainly because I don't want it to be categorized as a fault as it's not the story's fault that the BBC are idiots and threw shit away for no reason. However, I do want to mention it here mainly because the episodes of 1 and 3 got animated and they are easily the best looking animated reconstructions of Doctor Who, period. I've seen almost every single one with the exception of the newest ones and this one looks as close to the original version as much as possible and I love it. It also has great cliffhangers mainly of episode 1 and 3 with the Cybermen being revealed and the Cybermen marching across the moon. It is a very simple under siege story but I couldn't help but love it. The overall mystery at first to the idea of what the disease is, to the invasion, to the redesign, to the terrific animation for the lost episodes, to the very good production design, and overall a very good under siege story. The only major flaw I give it is that the music is really fucking weird and doesn't fit the serial at all. Now we get into the amazing stories with yet another Cyberman story at number 4, The Invasion. What an exceptional Cyberman epic this was. At 8 whole episodes with the Cybermen not appearing until the end of the 4th episode, this could have easily been an ungodly boring story. However, thanks to the terrific writing, the second appearance of Unit, the performances from the TARDIS crew, and especially the performance of Kevin Stoney, this manages to be one of the greatest Second Doctor stories, and one of the greatest Cybermen stories of all time. Possibly even the greatest. The Doctor's chemistry with the unit and the Brigadier is nothing short of fantastic, and one of the best parts of the serial. While I am not a huge fan of the big ear redesign like a lot of other fans are, it is still one of the best designs of the characters and certainly better than the new Who design. Anything involving the Cybermen in this story is nothing short of creepy, to their first appearance in the cliffhanger of episode 4, to the scenes in the sewers, to one of the most iconic shots in the show's history of the Cybermen rising out of the sewers and finally invading Earth. But the Cybermen aren't the only stars of the serial. Kevin Stoney's performance as Tobias Vaughn was nothing short of excellent. While in the Daleks master plan, the yellow face is very bad and he does chew the scenery a lot, here he is much more subdued and only gravitates towards major emotional outbursts at certain worthy moments in the story. He is a great bad guy, and it is somewhat upsetting that he wasn't used more worthy in the show after this. I didn't even realize he was in Revenge of the Cybermen until writing this video. If I had any flaws with the story, is that there is a bit of slowness earlier on and a stupid moment between the Brigadier and Isabel that I won't get into, but if you've seen the serial, you know what I'm talking about. Overall though, this story was excellent, from the performances to the villains of both Vaughn and the Cybermen, to the mystery, to creepy atmosphere in a lot of places, to the mostly well done pace, to the very good animation for episodes 1 and 4, 
and overall just an exceptional story that needs to be watched by any Doctor Who fan at least once. Number three is The Enemy of the World. This is certainly a story I didn't expect to like as much as I did. While the premise was great with Troughton doing dual roles, I never thought I would be like, oh yeah, one of the best second Doctor stories ever. But it really, really is. It is pretty much a political plot to take down a dictator in the far off year of 2018. That's pretty much it, with the TARDIS crew being trapped in the middle with the Doctor somehow looking exactly like the dictator named Salamander, for no reason that is ever explained. It certainly reminds me of a proto-third Doctor story, but done much better. It certainly feels like a, it would perfectly fit into his era if there was maybe some tweaks here and there, which does make sense since Barry Letts was the director of the episode. I thought Troughton as Salamander was undeniably fantastic. He plays evil exceptionally well. Despite being a bit one-dimensional in terms of his characters, I don't find that to be a major negative since that wasn't really the point of the character. This was definitely reminiscent of a Cold War thriller, but much more engaging and had a brisker pace than most. I think Jamie and Victoria are well utilized here, the story was very interesting, and despite the Doctor and Salamander not having a confrontation until the end of the serial, I think that majorly helped it as it feels more earned than it would if they met more than once. I also like how it's never explained why they look alike, they simply do. In today's world, they probably would have had some over-exaggerated explanation as to why they look alike, but here it's like, eh, whatever they just do. Overall, I thought this was a well-paced and well-acted story with stellar writing, fantastic performances, well-utilization of characters, and an overall interesting tone. Number two is The Macra Terror. Similar to The Enemy of the World, this is one of those stories where I didn't expect it to be as excellent as it was, yet here we are. When I first heard about it, I was like, giant crabs, really? I mean, the classic era had some idiotic stuff, but that is really the dumbest shit I have ever seen. But holy hell was this good. While I prefer the animation in the moon base, in terms of a full story, this is easily the best one. I think what makes this so good are two things. One, the crabs, called Macra, are an actual threat and are treated as such. If this were made today, everyone would point out, oh, that's dumb, giant crabs, really? And constantly make jokes about it. But here, it's treated like a serious threat. Then two, the Macra aren't technically the main feature of the serial. The main villain is this almost big brother-like personality that holds a grip on this human colony. While we later find out that this is the work of the Macra, the fact that the Macra aren't really showcased as the main villain until the last episode just holds true that the writing of this episode was incredibly fantastic. They're shrouded in shadow, not showcased very much, only hush whispers while the big brother personality tells them they're fine. I thought this was a great 1984-esque plot that showcases the undeniable power of great writing. I also like how Jamie's character is finally showcased properly, since he wasn't supposed to be a companion and wasn't really showcased as much as he could have been. And we are shown the first inkling as to why Jamie McCrimmon became one of the Doctor's most loyal companions. Ben and Polly are good in this serial as well, and I like how Ben slowly starts to favor the human colony and the Big Brother-like leader. While it is because of this special gas, I do think it would have been much more interesting to see him turn without it. But due to the fact that he's a pretty smart individual, it wouldn't have worked. Overall, this is a supremely excellent serial. From the performances, to the villains, to the well-executed social commentary, to the excellent writing, and proper showcase of companions make this a second Doctor must-watch. Then, finally, we get to number one, and any Doctor Who fans will immediately know what it is. The War Games. Absolutely everything about this serial is nothing short of absolutely excellent. The story is absolutely superb. It starts out with the TARDIS crew getting stuck in what they believe to be in the middle of a battle in World War I. They see weird things going on and nothing really making sense. It's only revealed to be the work of another Time Lord and another unnamed race led by the Warlord. It broadens the lore of the Time Lords and where the Doctor came from. It features a more serious threat from the Doctor's homeworld with the War Chief. There is an excellent story with a lot of suspense and mystery and great production design with phenomenal performances. I am going to keep this rather short because unlike the Time Meddler where it's a short story that manages to do everything right for me personally, this is just one of those stories that has to be seen to be truly experienced. It's very long, but it is most definitely worth it. You won't regret it. 
I know it's a cop-out to say that, and you think I might just be, oh, I'm too lazy. But please trust me on this. I already did kind of spoil it, but trust me. You need to see it. Just take a day and just watch it. It's so fucking good. Like, I know it's a regeneration story, but please, for the love of God, just fucking watch it. So now, after ranking the stories, now we rank companions. At the very bottom is most definitely Victoria. She wasn't an awful companion, but she's sort of the go-to companion when people who don't know Doctor Who very well want to point out that all the female companions are damsels in distress. She had a good personality and was fun when she wasn't in trouble or screaming. I just wish she had a bit more to do during her run since she was dealing with her father's death as well. Luckily, it was addressed in the famous scene in Tube of the Cybermen, but I do wish it was a bit more noted than that. She was good, but falling into those older tropes made her the worst Second Doctor companion in my eyes. Next are Ben and Polly. I do feel kinda bad because with both Doctors they were with, they kinda got the shit end of the stick and were overshadowed by much better companions. They weren't bad at all. While at first it was kind of implied that they were interested in one another, I do like how their reign with both doctors, it didn't go further than vague implications. They are better as platonic friends than as a couple, and they do have good chemistry with each other and with the doctor, and had a lot of great moments throughout their serials. There are just better companions than the two of them, which is why they're lower. Next is Zoe Harriot. I feel as though she was kind of an apology for Victoria. While Victoria just kind of screamed her way through her reign with the second doctor, Zoe was an extremely intelligent and capable companion, with a bit of hubris as well. She actually did grow with the second doctor and became more human than just being a computer on legs, which was unfortunately undone in the war games, but despite this, she became better through his adventures. Plus, she was capable in terms of her mind and saved the day on a couple different occasions. When she did start to grow, she developed a fun personality as well, and on top of that was absolutely adorable. As well as the doctor warning Zoe about the many dangers of traveling with him, learning what happened with Victoria. Capable and fun, Zoe manages to be a very good and somewhat underrated companion. Then, the obvious number one is Jamie McCrimmon. Never any doubt on who the Second Doctor's greatest companion is. Being in every single Second Doctor story with the exception of Power of the Daleks, Jamie managed to be one of the greatest and most loyal companions in Doctor Who, as well as appearing in the most episodes than any other companion. Being the Doctor's right-hand man and always believing in the Doctor whenever the situation was dire, he had a certain chemistry with the Second Doctor that I don't think any other Doctor-companion relationship could ever replicate mainly because Patrick Troughton and Fraser Hines were good friends before they filmed Doctor Who together. It was through the impeccable chemistry, the chivalrous nature of being an 18th century Highlander, the amazing writing, and always being loyal to the Doctor to a T, makes him the second Doctor's greatest companion. Now we get to overall thoughts about the second Doctor era. The second Doctor's era is in many ways an improvement on the first Doctor's era. They kind of found their niche and went with it, creating an overall very great era. There weren't a lot of bad serials, with the only trouble being is that they were hard to watch because there were more telesnap reconstructions than in the first Doctor era, and some stories were harder to watch because of that. While I am more forgiving to, of the telesnap reconstructions than a lot of other people are, there was still a certain hump to go over in terms of that, and that's why I said probably too many times that there were pacing issues. I don't blame that on the actual serials. Just the fact that with a lot of them, I had to watch a reconstruction. Despite this, I really liked a lot of these serials despite this. Again, when Troughton is great and the writing is stellar, then you get something very special. Which is definitely more of the time than in the first Doctor era. Even though I did state it does get repetitive some of the time with having the same type of stories and not as much of an experimental nature to the whole thing, I still really like this era as a whole. I just wish that there were more actual serials rather than just reconstructions. In terms of the actual Doctor though, I like Troughton's characterization. Even though he is so different from his original portrayal, in, the, in a lot of his earlier stories, I can still see William Hartnell in there somewhere. 
Whether that be a solution to a problem, the way he speaks, the way he figures something out, sometimes the first incarnation peeks out once in a while, and I kind of liked it, whether it be intentional or not. In terms of what Troughton does with the character, I do very much like the bumbling cosmic hobo that can be goofy to show that he might not be a threat, but under that shows that he still very much is, and is a lot smarter than people make him out to be. While this was taken to 11 with Sylvester McCoy's portrayal, I like how he is more subdued here and how he never goes full-on goofy clown like Matt Smith's portrayal in Series 7 of New Who. Everything about Troughton's portrayal is just so great and balanced that I couldn't help but enjoy it as well as being intrigued enough to see how he will get out of any situation with the smarts he has underneath his goofy mask. Overall, I really like what happened and what they did with the Second Doctor era. While the first Doctor's era was a gamble because he was just starting out and they didn't know what to do, here it's cemented Doctor Who's place in British pop culture, because if the second Doctor's era failed, there would be no Doctor Who. So both 60s eras are vastly important to the beginning and cementation of Doctor Who as an era defining television series that would become bigger than anyone ever thought possible. I majorly liked the era, I majorly liked the second Doctor, and if I had to rate him in the Doctors I've seen so far, I would probably rate him 5th. But with all of that said, next time we tackle the start of Doctor Who's Golden Age with Mr. John Pertwee.